that are on the webinar, please note that we will be muting your microphone during the presentation. And after the presentation, there will be um, uh, sufficient time for Q&A. Um, okay. Uh, so let's start. The, um, the last uh, press seminar we held was, I think, at the end of November last year. And um, already th back then we signaled that 2019 would definitely be weaker from an economic and from a steel market perspective. Basically because of uh, we were seeing clear trends of, of slowing trade, uh, slowing global economic growth, slowing growth in Europe, industry suffering. And actually what we've seen in the past few months is that these trends have actually intensified um, with all the related risks for um, our outlook. So um, I'll skip the first slide. Um, let's start with the economic outlook, some indicator graphs, um, which clearly show that um, Already in 2018, we've seen <clears throat> a downward trend in, in, in confidence indicators, but they were still holding up rather well during the year. Only at the end of the year, we saw a more of a, um, an acceleration in, in the downward trend. And that is particularly true for the first four months of this year. Um, and particularly April has seen a significant um, downturn in, in, in confidence levels. The general economy, the left-hand top chart. Um, consumer confidence, less affected than industrial confidence. As you can see, the bottom chart on the right-hand side really shows that uh, industrialists assess the current and the, uh, the short-term outlook as, as definitely less, less positive than uh, the last two years. We are now back at the sort of level we've seen in 2014 to 2016. And um, the left-hand bottom chart is from market. Um, and there we see an interesting trend, which um, confirms the downtrend in industry. Uh, that's the red line in that graph. The blue line represents services, and they're still holding up rather well in terms of confidence. The reason why confidence has come down, of course, is very much related to what we've seen already starting last year, uh, the slowing trend in growth of international trade um, because of protectionist measures taken, uh, taken globally. Um, we've also seen global economic growth slowing down. Um, particularly EU industry has been facing severe headwinds, um, particularly since the, the second half of last year. And they intensified, as I said before, in the first months of 2019. Um, well, let's take a step back. The fourth quarter of 2018, what, what happened there? Um, we've seen um, uh, growth, economic growth, quarter on quarter, coming back to well, remaining at 0.2% uh, for the Eurozone, 0.3% quarter on quarter for the EU28 which is rather modest. Um, main reason for um, weak economic growth has been that investment growth was definitely slowing down. Uh, we also saw, uh, have seen a slightly negative impact of the inventory cycle. Uh, it also reflects, of course, uh, reduced confidence in, in the manufacturing sector where uh, companies wanted to, uh, to reduce their stock levels at the end of the year. All in all, 2018, still 1.9% uh, GDP growth, but basically because of a, a strong first half. Um, and then clearly the phenomena that, that characterized the second half of 2018 was the downturn in industry. Um, you can see that in the, in the bottom graph where first two quarters still show for, let's say the, for the major EU economies, still significant uh, industrial production growth, uh, but then returning to, um, to zero growth in the third quarter, negative growth in the fourth quarter. And um, in the first two months of this year, we see a continuation of negative growth in Germany, particularly Germany 
is affected by the, the downturn in, uh, in industry in, uh, in Europe. Um, France was positive in the first month, uh, slightly negative in, in February. Italy, um, a bit better uh, than, than at the end of last year. And also we've seen, um, let's say, a rather positive trend in February in Spain. So it's a bit mixed, but it's clear that industry is, uh, is not performing as it was before. Um, then the first quarter of 2019, we have now a, 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 a draft preliminary estimate from Eurostat for GDP growth. And actually that was a, a bit of a surprise because the EU 28 returned to 0.5% quarter on quarter growth and the, um, the Eurozone to 0.4%, which actually doesn't fit with the indicators we've seen. Now the reason may be that Germany is still missing in that it's estimate. So, and Germany is an important part of it. Um, so that already uh, indicates that we have to be cautious um, with the interpretation of, of, of that trend. Um, but it's true that Italy was in recession in the second half of last year. It went out of recession in, in, uh, since the start of this year. We've seen rather stable growth in France. We've seen actually a, a slight growth acceleration in Spain. What we also seen is that construction has continued to do rather well, basically because of uh, rather favorable weather conditions. Um, so that could explain at least to some extent the, the, the unexpected positive trend in the first quarter. However, um, given the weakness of the indicators and other hard data we have right now, um, we really don't expect that this will continue in the remainder of 2019. We're particularly worried about uh, manufacturing performance and, and then particularly performance of Germany. So the outlook for 2019 and 20, um, if you look at the, um, the headwinds we, we had seen um, already in 2018, it uh, was particularly trade trade disappointed in 2018. Um, again, we are not very positive about trade conditions in 2019. Um, that has to do with, uh, of course, the um, uh, trade tensions between US and China on the one hand, US and EU on the other hand. And um, it, it, particularly the um, of course, we're worried about the potential repercussions from, from any uh, um, actions taken by the US regarding the automotive exports from Europe to the, uh, uh, to the US. Um, at the same time, there had been progress in the negotiations between the US and China that appears to have stalled, um, with Trump <laughs> announcing an increase in the uh, tariffs related to the Section 301 investigation from 10 to 25%. So things are not really moving in the right direction right lately. Um, at the start of this year, international trade was growing at the slowest rate uh, of the past 10 years. So there's, let's say, not much um, in favor currently of expecting an improvement in trade conditions this year. Um, some indicators are not that bad, uh, related to China, for instance, related to uh, 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 transport activity, uh, but we are very cautious on, on trade. The weaker euro could, to some extent, support um, um, eurozone exporters uh, in 2019 and 20. Um, so the strength for the um, um, for the EU has to come from domestic demand. Now, the outlook for private consumption is, is rather positive. Uh, we only expect uh, a slight moderation in private consumption growth this year and next. Um, it has to do with the uh, continued strength of the labor market in the EU. Um, be in March, unemployment rate in the EU was down to the lowest level since actually the series started in 2000. Uh, in 2000. Um, so that's, that's quite positive. Um, actually, in some parts of the labor market, there is a tightness, um, and it has led to um, 
an increase in um, in wages. Salaries have been uh, been going up uh, in most countries. For investment, the other part um, of domestic demand, um, we have our concerns, and that is, of course, again related to, on the one hand, confidence levels, which we've seen coming down. Confidence is uh, the sort of the lubricant for investment if, if companies don't have confidence in current business conditions or in future business conditions, they don't invest. There are also, of course, worries about the trade, um, the trade environment, uh, which is not supportive to, uh, to investment at this point in time. So we clearly see a risk in investment. We, we still are expecting a slight growth of investment, definitely less than before. Um, but clearly the risk is, is both in trade and investment for the EU at this point in time. That is clearly realized by the European Central Bank. Um, and while they have ended their net uh, asset purchases at the end of last year, they also have announced a new round of uh, long-term refinancing operations, the so-called uh, TLTROS, with the aim of, let's say, keeping um, uh, lending conditions accommodative, uh, access to finance uh, easy, and cost of borrowing rather cheap. Um, hopefully that works to some extent. All in all, we can say that definitely the risks have sh shifted further to the downside. In recent months, it was already the case at the start of this year that we were rather concerned, uh, but that didn't improve. Um, and particularly, I'm going to repeat it again, we see the, the risk of, of an escalation of trade frictions and of course Brexit. Brexit is still very much unknown what will happen. Um, and it, it will continue to uh, uh, uncertainty uh, for um, private consumers, but also particularly for companies at both sides of the channel. So GDP growth, our estimate for our forecast for uh, 2019 and 20 is 1.5%. Uh, so clearly from higher growth in 2017, already slower growth in 2000. Um, uh, 18, we're now back to the sort of midterm potential growth rate of 1.5%. The next section is about the still using sectors. Again, I will start with a set of indicator graphs. And actually we see there the same trends. We saw in the, the general economy, things are going down and things are going down actually a bit more steeper in industry already since the start of 2018 than in the general economy. Um, but clearly in line what we've seen with general economic confidence, um, the downward trend in the first four months of this year has been rather steep. That applies to, um, for instance, the assessment of export orders by EU, uh, EU industry, uh, sharp downturn actually at the, uh, over the first four months of this year. The right hand top chart shows uh, how companies assess their stocks in relation to their, their sales activity, clearly gone up sharply um, since late 2018 and really accelerating over the past few months. Um, on the bottom row left-hand chart, we see the order assessment by industry. Uh, four main steel-using industries uh, are shown in the graph. It's metal goods motor vehicles, uh, mechanical engineering, and the building sector. And there uh, we see the, um, the blue and the red lines, which represent metal goods and mechanical engineering, really coming down rather sharply again in March, April. Uh, they had been a bit stable at the start of this year, giving some hope of remaining stable. It didn't happen. Um, automotive at a lower level, an upward trend in, in in April, but uh, we have to be cautious about that. Construction building sector is still rather stable. And it all led to a significantly um, more pessimistic view on forward uh, production expectations. So let's start with um, the outlook for the construction sector. Um, last year, the fourth quarter was still quite good actually robust growth, um, 
and particularly Central Europe has uh, shown continuation of a, of a strong performance, double digit growth in most of the countries in that region. It all led to uh, almost 5% growth in output in 2018, similar to growth in 2017. So that sector is clearly, so far at least, less affected by um, the economic uh, slowdown in Europe. And if you look at the top graph, which represents construction confidence, there we also see that construction confidence is holding up rather well. Okay, there's a slight uh, downward trend, but, but it's not really uh, very sharp. At the same time, it's also clear that this sector is not immune for what's happening in the wider economy. Of course, they also depend on um, confidence and investment. Um, but let's say there we have uh, indications that are less affected um, than uh, other sectors, basically because this sector is not dependent on the performance of exports. Um, so we expect that in the coming two years, um, construction output will continue to grow, but that there will be a slowdown in growth. However, the growth slowdown will be rather gradual and mild. In terms of growth drivers, um, we've seen a very strong performance of the housing sector over the past few years. It has to do with uh, um, a strong rebound of the property sector in Europe, um, both uh, private property, rental property, uh, conditions has really uh, been improving over time. And um, there's a very strong appetite for, um, for housing um, demand. Uh, of course, has to do with the fact that uh, people prefer to put their money in bricks at this point in time than leave it on a bank. Um, there's actually in, in quite a few countries in Europe a shortage of, of, of affordable housing. Um, and um, that is also leading to a, a rather strong um, growth in housing renovation, housing modernization. Um, and we continue to be rather positive for the housing sector, although in countries such as Germany, which has seen a very strong boom, we, we do see these boom conditions weakening to some extent. Um, but overall, I think um, that the sector will continue to perform rather well. Um, it has also to do with the inflow of uh, uh, people from, from, let's say, the um, uh, Syria, uh, the, the asylum seekers, uh, which um, also lead to a, an increase in demand for affordable housing. Then because of the strong growth in, in the housing uh, sector, um, at one point in time, you also need to build new shops, um, uh, retail centers, uh, schools, hospitals, and that's really what started in 2018. There we saw the, the first effects of, of that trend. So also non-residential building activity is picking up and we continue to, uh, to expect growth, although uh, part of this is, is, is based on private investment. And there we might see a sort of moderation in growth, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, those parts of the building sector, which is more, which are more related to uh, to transport and and, and manufacturing uh, commercial buildings. Civil engineering, clear driver, but particularly in Central Europe. However, in increasingly, um, we see also positive trends elsewhere in um, in Europe. Um, Particularly in France, there's the uh, uh, a building program which aims at improving the uh, public transport uh, uh, infrastructure around Paris and in Paris. It's a big project. Um, we see in Italy um, um, a railroad improvement program. So governments are really investing in, um, in infrastructure. Um, it's also true for Germany. Uh, so that's becoming also more of a driver and uh, could to some extent um, take over the role of the, uh, the non-residential building sector. So all in all, we've remained rather 
positive for overall growth in the sector. We have to realize that this sector is actually um, working at rather high capacity utilization rates. Um, in some countries, the delays, for instance, in, in permits uh, uh, are quite long. Of course, that's, that's more for public authorities, um, uh, but we don't see much of an improvement there. There are definitely labor shortages in some countries, so there are also some limitations in terms of the, uh, the potential growth rate. So from around 5% last year, we see output growth slowing to just above 2% in 2019 and slightly lower than 2% in 2020, which overall is definitely not too bad. Situation is less positive for the automotive sector. And um, as you can see in the, in the top graph, we've seen a, a, a downturn in, in European car sales since September 2018. Um, of course, that had to do with the, the impact of the introduction of the new um, emission testing standards in Europe, uh, the WLTP. Uh, prior to the, the September, uh, most car manufacturers in Europe were trying to get rid of their pre-WLTP uh, vehicles, selling them with um, uh, significant discounts. That advanced to some extent demand which was there in the market. So we've seen a negative trend in demand in the remainder of the year. Um, demand didn't pick up in the first four months of the year. We've seen again uh, a downward trend in automotive sales since the start of this year. Sales fell actually by 3.3% over the first four months of the year. Um, also car exports are under pressure, it has to do with uh, let's say major markets in Europe and elsewhere facing a downtrend, uh, exports um, abroad are suffering from stalling car sales in the US. Uh, Turkey is an important market for car exports. There we see a downward trend, China. Um, so also um, car exports are under pressure. In contrast, commercial vehicle demand continue to grow. We've seen 5.1% uh, growth over the first four months of the year. Um, so that's a positive trend, but of course it's not enough to uh, balance the downward trend in, in car sales. Um, total production fell by more than 5% in the fourth quarter, leading to a total um, output growth of just 0.6%. And you can see in the bottom graph where um, on, the, on the left-hand side of the, of the chart, we see annual growth. It has been much more robust in, in preceding years. Um, so hardly any growth last year. And actually for this year, we expect a slight uh, drop in, in, in automotive output. It has to do with the fact that we're clearly seeing saturation effects in the market. And of course, another factor is that there's clearly uncertainty for um, potential car buyers about the impact of um, new legislation regarding um, uh, diesel and petrol cars. Uh, you probably also heard news about Amsterdam blocking all petrol and diesel cars by 2030. Uh, if that happens uh, on a wider scale in Europe, um, uh, consumers will get extremely worried about uh, uh, the devaluation of their, the value of their car. It's, um, and not all buyers are able and willing to buy new cars. Um, so it's, it's going to be an issue going forward. We, we do see a, a very moderate positive trend in, in sales of electrical uh, vehicles. Um, but um, on the other hand, there's still a shortage of, um, of uh, charging infrastructure in Europe. Prices are, in the mind of, of many car buyers, still too high. So uh, buyers are not rushing to buy electric vehicles at this point in time. Nevertheless, we do see a trend, um, which was started already several years ago by the, uh, the main OEMs in Europe, that they, at this point in time, particularly focus on... Um, 
increasing their model mix towards electric vehicles, whether it's all electric uh, or other types of, uh, of um, drivetrains. Um, that is the way forward. Um, so 2020 will definitely see a significant increase in new electric vehicle model launches. That could to some extent uh, lead to um, an improvement in sales in um, in 2020, but we do expect that 2019 will be negative in terms of the overall performance of the European uh, car market. And then again, um, I said it uh, at the start of the presentation, we are quite worried about um, the impact of tariffs uh, from the US government on EU exports of automotive vehicles and parts and components to the US. It would clearly uh, be a major issue uh, particularly for Germany, uh, Italy. Um, another issue is that um, given the slowdown in the market we're currently seeing, quite a few um, producers active uh, in Europe are looking how to uh, free up funds for investment. Uh, one way to do that is to, um, to manage capacity, or actually over capacity in the sector in, in, in Europe. Um, and the idea is to free up funds for investment in alternative powertrains. So that's also going to have an impact. All in all, uh, a slight drop in output this year, 0.2%, and then uh, a slight growth in 2021, 0.6% plus. The last sector is mechanical engineering. Um, as you know, a sector which is typically reliant on investment uh, and and therefore confidence um, also rather reliant on exports so this sector has not been doing rather well um, and you can see that in the um, the graph on order assessment uh, of the sector where there's a split between total orders and export orders well both move actually in the same way uh, since early 2018 from clearly a peak level but um, and the order assessment really deteriorated uh, over the past uh, 16 months. Due to the um, weaker order inflow, the order books which were there at the start of last year have been drying up quite rapidly. Um, so while there was still growth um, last year, uh, total growth of slightly less than 4%, the fourth quarter already showed hardly any growth. So that's where we see the impact of the, uh, the, uh, the orders drying up. And unfortunately, we don't see much of an improvement in uh, 2019 and 20. The headwinds which were there in 2018 will only intensify probably. That's related to, of course, uh, global trade conditions, uh, a global slowdown in economic growth, um, lower, Production growth in the EU would also mean that there's less pressure on uh, capacity utilization um, and the capacity restraints, which were in, particularly in 2007 are going to ease. So no need for companies to invest at this point in time in installing new capacity. Also the fact that profits have been lower already since a couple of quarters is not helping in that respect. Um, so all in all, we are not really positive about the sector um, for this year next. And of course, all the concerns which are there and the headwinds are exacerbated by what we're seeing currently in the terms of the, uh, the global protectionist environment and the impact of Brexit uh, on, on, on business conditions going forward. Another uh, thing we are, we are seeing in this sector is that if there is investment, it is increasingly in, in efficiency improvement, artificial intelligence, which is not clearly related um, to steel or any other material, but it's largely in software. And uh, of course, that's also limiting uh, the, the positive impact for the steel sector. So we are currently um, expecting only 0.4% growth this year. Um, maybe a bit higher, 0.8 in 2020, but that compares to growth of around uh, 6% in 2017, 4% in 2018. So clearly a rather sharp downturn. 
So what was the impact on the steel market? Um, as you can imagine, the deterioration in the economic environment, the downturn in the manufacturing sector uh, does have an impact on our forecast for the steel market. Let's get back to 2018. Um, it's the top graph. And um, over the year, and I already showed this graph in November, um, well, all in all, apparent steel consumption, steel demand, it, it still grew uh, by 3% in 2018, actually a bit higher than, than expected in November. Um, but, and that's represented by the blue bars. If you look at the, uh, uh, well, what's it, what is pink bars, um, th those represent imports, and imports have been growing much stronger than demand, and therefore much stronger than domestic deliveries by EU producers. Imports rose by almost 13% last year. And as you can see, the increase year on year was actually higher in the second half than in the first half. Uh, of course, it has to do with the, uh, the comparable levels of the preceding year, but, uh, but nevertheless, one can say that uh, um, in spite of the preliminary safeguards, the um, import pressure remained extremely high in the second half. Of course, there was some effect, um, but it didn't prevent from uh, imports from remaining at, uh, at a level which were definitely uh, uh, destabilizing the European steel market. So we've only see, um, we've seen um, an increase in domestic deliveries um, of less than 2%, 1.7%. And that meant that also in 2018, imports gained market share compared to um, EU mills. Overall, market share was 24% of imports in 2018 compared to 22% in 2017. In the final quarter of the year, the share was 25%. Um, now, there definitely has been some speculation on um, um, by particularly distribution chain um, and some distributors were encouraged to build stocks um, and we've seen in the uh, statistics which are available um, that the year although it has seen in the second half a stock reduction, the year ended with higher stocks than normal. Um, all in all, I think what we've seen in terms of, of conditions in the steel market um, in the second half of the year really underpin that the threat of trade deflection uh, from resulting from the uh, US Section 232 uh, measures is still very much alive. Looking forward to 2019 and 20, um, and it's very much in line, of course, with a sort of uh, um, rather cautious outlook for the steel using sectors in 2019 and 20. Um, the final steel use um, is not going to grow really very, very significantly. There's only a, a very modest growth expected. Um, and with currently high stocks at the start of the year, um, there's also no need to build stocks, probably only to reduce stocks over the year, and that also have a negative impact on apparent steel consumption. So all in all, we, we do expect that apparent steel consumption will actually fall this year by 0.4% uh, before coming back to positive growth in 2020, when we don't expect that much of a stock cycle effect. Um, unfortunately, there is no evidence at all if you look at the, the international steel markets um, of an easing in pressures in terms of, uh, of competition. Uh, and we therefore uh, are very concerned about the proposed relaxation of the safeguards, the, the final safeguard measures uh, with a 5% increase in, um, in February. And again, another proposed 5% increase in July this year which at least if you take account what the market is currently, uh, 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 how the market is developing with actually a negative trend and then allowing for a 10% increase in 
in safeguard volumes, that doesn't seem to fit, at least not um, in the view of Eurofer. I would like to give a bit more information about um, uh, imports. And, and um, I mean, there's one phenomena which is quite clear in this respect. It's that Turkey is desperate to sell their steel in Europe. Um, as you know, the Turkish economy is under pressure. Uh, the euro crisis last year, um, and there also manufacturing sector is, is suffering. We've seen a, a downturn in, in domestic demand um, of around 50% uh, last year. Uh, it continued in the first month of this year. And um, um, at the same time, we haven't seen that much of a reduction in production. Uh, there was some, but it's clear that Turkey is, is strongly focusing on selling material into the largest nearby market, which is the EU. In 2019, the first quarter, Turkey, Turkish imports accounted for 28% of total imports. Um, it was 21% in 2018, so a significant increase. Uh, at the same time, Turkey is not only, as you can see the, uh, from the top graph, which shows the, um, uh, the main currencies of, of origin for imports into the EU, is not only the largest import, it is also the fastest growing importer, because imports rose by 35% in um, the first quarter year, year. They had already grown by 65% in 2018. Um, and if we... Uh, these, these data are coming from the European customs statistics. If we take Turkish customs data, um, we can also see what Turkish mills have been uh, shipping to other countries or other regions than Europe. And there we see an interesting phenomena that um, over the uh, first two months of the year, um, if you compare that with the, uh, the average, the monthly average over 2017, that's actually shown in the bottom graph, um, we see the, the diverging trend in Turkish exports to the EU and those to all other countries, all other third countries, excluding the EU. And there we see a 71% increase in exports to the EU, a 3% rise uh, in, um, in exports to other countries. In contrast, uh, EU is also exporting material to, the, to Turkey, other countries are as well, and there we see a stronger decrease in European exports to Turkey and other countries. So Europe is really suffering from um, deterioration in domestic market conditions in, in Turkey. As it is, 42% uh, of total Turkish exports uh, over the first two months ended up in the European market, and if you take if you single out only flat products, it's even 72%. So really the majority of Turkish products destined for exports are ending up in the EU. Uh, however, of course, Turkey is not the only country that is shipping material to the EU. Um, you also see, um, uh, if you take the, uh, the EU uh, statistics, custom statistics, that um, imports from Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, rose rather strongly in the first quarter of 2019. On the other hand, India, Brazil, um, which were rather present in the market with quite a lot of volume in 2018, they have actually reduced their, uh, their exports to the EU in the first quarter. And <clears throat> that brings me to the, um, the final slide, which sums up the key messages of the presentation. Um, in the first four months of the year, we've seen indicators which are really rather soft. Um, and as it is, that's, let's say, not a positive indicator of what might happen in the remainder of the year. Um, also worthwhile to note is that, okay, quarter one growth may have been a bit stronger than expected, but don't expect it to last um, because the underlying data are, let's say, to some extent dubious. Um, and um, uh, definitely we will see a slowdown in economic growth going forward. 
All in all, GDP growth only 1.5% in 2019 and 20, which implies a return to sort of midterm potential growth rate for the, uh, for the economy in the EU. And what's very clear is that it is the manufacturing sector which is currently suffering the most uh, under the current conditions. Reason, um, there are a lot of external internal headwinds. Uh, there are high levels of uncertainty uh, and that's particularly having a negative impact on confidence. Um, clear to, uh, needless to say that the, the, the balance of risk shifted to the downside in recent months and that has to do with uh, a negative uh, uh, perception of, of the, uh, the trade environment, investment environment. Um, Sector-wise, construction uh, will continue to do rather well. The other sectors definitely much less. What we've seen in 2018 in terms of the steel market, the threat of the trade deflection is still very much alive and not much change there. Uh, Turkish mills use the exports to the EU as a safety valve for their domestic problems. Um, overall, that leads to a subdued outlook for the EU steel market in 2019 and 2020. We do expect there will be rather cautious stock management. Unfortunately, stocks were rather high at the start of this year. So that's going to also depress steel demand, um, which will fall by 0.4% this year and a slight rise expected in 2020. All in all, um, we haven't seen much of improvement of the um, international steel market in terms of their competitive pressures. It has to do with the continuation of significant overcapacity uh, which is currently estimated by the OECD at uh, 550 million tons of crude steel. Um, and um, we therefore think that, and that's really the bottom line of, of my presentation, um, that relaxation of the safeguard measures, um, which imply a 10% increase in, in safeguard volumes over the course of 2019 is clearly out of step with what we are seeing currently in the market today. This is where I would like to end my uh, presentation. I thank you for your attention. And um, Pra first, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Well, I'm, I was rather thinking about questions because I don't have a, uh, a presentation on the safeguard. We don't have questions, we can, you know, give a brief, brief briefcase and then ask Yeah, I can get a couple. So on the safeguard, so where are we? Um, In February, the Commission um, published the decision to impose final safeguard measures, replacing the provisional safeguard measures, which kicked in somewhere in July, if I'm not wrong, 2018. And so in February this year, they replaced the provisional safeguard measures by a final set of, of tariff rate quota. So the same system continues to apply, tariff rate quota, volumes per product, um, carbon flat, carbon long, stainless. The product scope basically remained unchanged uh, for the final measures. Uh, tariff rate quota um, for the period up to July 2021, which then would cover a three-year period starting from the first day of the provisional measures of July 2018. Um, there are some changes in the modalities of the final safeguard measures compared to the provisional measure. Um, most importantly, the, um, the products, the quota per product received a split up among major exporting countries. The, the share is 5% of a reference period um, where they benefit a country, their own country specific national quota. 
Um, this has been published, so you, you, you have seen this uh, for sure. So you have this for all the products. Um, and then, in addition, while only the major exporting countries have received a, a national quota, which, by the way, was requested in the run-up to the final safeguard measures, which was requested by a lot of exporting countries, as that would give them a certain stability and security. Um, but not all exporting countries have received a national quota. You don't give a national quota for those who have exported uh, traditionally only 10 tons in a year. So you have then also a basket of what is called residual volume for all other countries um, who have not been uh, important um, exporters of the product concern to the EU in the past. Uh, the past here, reference period is 2015-17. This is the period where the Commission looked at for calculating national quotas, but also the global quota, because the national quotas are just a subdivision of the national of the of the global quota for the major ones. Uh, except for one product, which is hot rolled flat, which is hot rolled coil, and also some slitted material, but it's basically hot rolled coil, which is the basic product for the flat integrated flat steel segment of the steel industry. Um, where, for reasons, um, and that was already known, um, that issue uh, from the start of the provisional measures, because there are multiple anti dumping duties in place for that product which had in 2016, 17, had changed the pattern of traditional import flows by exporting country. Uh, so this is basically the, the, the situation we have. Um, we have, uh, uh, in addition to the uh, mostly uh, national country specific tariff rate quota plus residual, the commission added also relaxation, as, as you mentioned. Uh, as a final conclusion, the relaxation included, first of all, uh, a 5% increase of the quota volumes from the day of the imposition of the final measures, which was uh, early February, but including an automatic further increase of 5% in at the first anniversary of safeguard measures, which is July uh, 2019, so this year and which opens the second year of the quota of the safeguard period. So the period is July 18, July 2021. So at the February, then at the first anniversary, the first year safeguard, another 5%. And then a year later in July 2020, um, there will be another 5% increase. So that gives you indeed 10% within, uh, within a year or within the year, um, February, um, and and uh, and 2019 in a context where indeed uh, steel demand has has is stagnating or has stagnated in particular for uh, impacting most severely the import of not the imports but the, the products um, uh, flat steel products which typically go into other manufacturing industries while construction does continue to show some growth and this is not the case basically. Uh, for industrial applications of, of, of steel, uh, which is basically flat steel. Um, so these are a bit in a nutshell, the, the key uh, changes with the final measures. I don't know if you have questions. There are issues we have with this. If you look into the monitoring, and this is publicly available, uh, if you look to the monitoring on an ongoing basis in real time of the quota consumption, you do see for certain products quite critical situations evolving there. But perhaps um, if there are already questions now on this, and then I can, in function of that, add some more clarifications. So uh, why don't we start with the people to the group as well? Yeah, a uh, question for Carl. Um, I think uh, it's in the trade trade committee in the parliament has been actually was it last month? Last month, yes. It was fairly clear. You're not going to get any change on the five percent, you know, ten percent annual um, increase in the reduction. I was wondering what what realistically do you want when the review comes out, and are you still expecting it to come early? The review as well. 
uh, we we expect. I think he mentioned also uh, the commission also mentioned that they would look into the the review earlier because in the public in the decision it was said there is this, there is a review clause there which is saying look we we will do a review so there is a clear commitment that's important because that was not at all sure at the provisional stage I think their member states have been putting some pressure on the commission to uh, to ensure that uh, the, the, the measure has to be evaluated or the system has to be evaluated in terms of its effectiveness. Um, so it, uh, and what we also hear and, and it was, it was in fact said, so they are going to um, accelerate the process of review uh, and we hope even to see uh, a start of the process still this month. Um, now about the 5% consecutive increases. The, as far as we understand, the the review, and I think you can also see this in the way the review clause was was written out, the review for the commission is about specific situations. Is there something in the implementation which is problematic? The 5% is not a specific situation in the sense that there is a problem for hot rolled flat here and then you have a specific problem for Indonesia stainless. No, the 5% is basically about the relaxation. The relaxation is a general condition imposed by WTO on safeguard uh, measures taken by WTO members. So uh, the problem we see and the commission seems to consider this as a fundamental condition of a legitimate or legal safeguard and that is across the board it's not unique for a hot road because you know there are there are more than 20 products which have their own individual quota it's not for one specific situation it is for the whole product coverage it's for the whole system as such and that probably the commission would like to avoid such a fundamental across the board change to uh, to an overall aspect condition of the safeguard steel safeguard as a whole um, so that may clarify why uh, the commission may be very reluctant to do this um, I think we can only repeat that from the economic point of view from the perspective of our industry who who relies on on the safeguards for the reasons we know about protectionism global access capacity the us in this situation uh, knocking out imports with global implications of trade flows that the safeguard here needs to needs to consider its its effectiveness 10 percent in a in a zero or even negative growth market is is undermining the effectiveness for all the products concerned and there you have a clash or a friction between some wto conditions which we do not dispute relaxation well they call it uh, gradual liberalization is part of the wto so we we need to understand and accept that somewhere this has to be reflected in the steel safeguard but does it have to be 10 percent in a year wto doesn't say it has to be five percent then and then you do another five percent you can have relaxation in another way you can have relaxation by not re by not increasing the quota and the tariff rate quota but you could also decrease the tariff for example you could say instead of five percent twice five percent I do twice 2.5% reduction in the tariff above quota. That would be perfectly legitimate under the WTO. And at the same time, you use this room of maneuver as an investigating authority, the commission here. Um, you use the room given by WTO who not at all give any clear indication or condition on what precisely the, how the relaxation should be so that you would be WTO compatible at the same time you would reflect the real concern of the volume the impact the commission were realistic to do that uh, you know the reduction of the plans uh, um, we don't know we have no view on this our view indeed is that the commission seems to be rather stubborn with what they have decided in the decision five percent five percent is something Europe has to do 
because WTO is imposing relaxation, but of course modalities can be different. And, and for the moment, we don't see there any movement, indeed. Uh, of course, the review has not started. We are making the case, like we're doing now, we're doing it in separate briefs and information, and we're also making the case, of course, towards the member states. But I think it's a bit premature now to conclude that it will not happen. But I think you're right that there is serious uh, hesitation or, or even reluctance uh, in the Commission administration to, to go for, for such a fundamental change. But it would be perfectly legitimate. There are ways to do it. A follow-up question. Is there any way to balance the relaxation? through the modalities, through uh, changing the, the quota the way it works, or the levels, or the product? Uh, uh, it's a good question. Um, I'm not a trade lawyer expert because they're, they're, you need to go very deep in, in these things. Uh, probably it's not that obvious. Um, one of the reason, things I, I, I was having in mind, but we haven't yet developed it perhaps properly, is the, but again, you will have, you're still facing the, the, the reluctance, I guess, with that argument, but just for the sake of, of looking for other ways, you know, from other angles into this is, if, if you have uh, a market, which in the meantime, because markets, dynamics change very rapidly, too rapidly. The Commission has built a construction of safeguard for three years. And markets have changed fundamentally over the previous months, since the beginning of the year. And, and that, that goes against this static construction, which has been developed for three years, 5%. It is published, it's in, put in concrete, and it, it cannot move. This is what the Commission basically is here. We cannot change this. And, and, but, but then, so there is, there's a question of will indeed to open up that, that point. Now, if you go back to the question here of, of the relaxation and you see, could you say that by keeping the volumes as they are fixed based on a reference period where you had some increase in demand, now by in a situation where this quota continue to be applicable without relaxation or a very small one that in fact there is still liberalization because the market doesn't need that much tonnage anymore from imports so the, the imports can take a bigger share of a reducing market even with the current quota because the demand conditions have changed negatively from the reference period. So you could say the demand, the softening of the, the, the stagnation of the demand, it, while the quota still remain unchanged, they don't go down, but you don't need to go up with the quota to give them a better <laughs> a more market access because relaxation is about giving increasing market access to imports. So you could also argue this, it's all about the concept of relaxation of gradual liberalization uh, uh, but we come back to the same uh, question. Is there a will of the Commission to rethink the modality of 5 plus 5 plus 5 and to look for other ways considering the market situation which is st stagnating and in, in some sectors like automotive even negative, which has a huge impact of the flat product segment, of course, given the dominant or the importance of, of that sector. Uh, there are for sure ways with experts to look for alternative ways of relaxation or reasoning of relaxation. But again, at the end of the day, we need to have there the commission, the will to, to look into this, to open that question, to open that box, which is not specific for one product, but for the whole system. Therefore, the reluctance. Uh, and that will have to be seen in the next, in the, in the next months ahead. Yeah. Um, I think the the way the next month the situation of steel will evolve will impact that question. 
Um, I think Arsometal has announced that they are going to reduce production. And this is a question to a, to adjust to adjust to the yeah the depressing situation in flat products. I think we need to perhaps focus here a bit more on flat products because that situation is more more depressing. Steel prices, um, hot rolled flat price has um, basically gone down from uh, a healthy profit level, including a healthy profit level in mid 2018, I think it was about 550, 540, 560, depending north south uh, euros. And we are now at prices and the really knockdown came, coincided with the uh, but the import search of Turkish hot rolled flat in January, February, the prices are now at, um, at in the south, they are at uh, 460. And the north, they are a bit higher. Yeah. There you always have a bit of premium there. So the situation in which the safeguard was constructed, looking in response to the Trump measure, in the context of global X capacity, in Europe, things have changed dramatically, in particular for flat products. And that is basically for us a reason uh, that would justify to look again into the question of relaxation, for example. So we've had two questions uh, on the chat, uh, which I'll read out, which are related to what we've just discussed. So um, these are from Diana Kitch at Platts, who asks, um, does Eurofer expect any further production cuts to be announced? By companies following Arsenal Macau's announcement of a three million per year cut yesterday, does Eurofa have an estimate for crude steel production this year? And second part, which is, um, is Eurofa planning to lobby against the safeguards review with the five percent with the five percent increases? How does it plan to lobby? So here's a two cut two parts to this. I don't know, you know, on the first part, do you have any indication? Uh, on, the, on the first part, um, it could well be that other companies will, will follow the example of ArcelorMittal, of course, depending on, on let's say, their, their end markets, their product mix, um, as already indicated before, construction is doing definitely a bit better. So if you're a longs producer, there's probably not that much need to reduce output or, or temporarily shut down capacity. A flat producer may be uh, considering to, um, to do so, but again, depending on, let's say, the, the type of products produced. Um, Eurofer does not produce or not give any uh, forward-looking estimates for production that's uh, let's say against uh, competition law in in Europe so we cannot do that um, and then I'll get back to to Carl the, the second question no? yeah. or the third one well yeah I, th I think what we what I just uh, mentioned on the relaxation basically gives an answer to um, to that question what whether Eurofair is lobbying in particular the relaxation well, I mean, the safeguard is an, is an investigation, is a procedure, starting with the provisional stage, and now it goes into a first review. And of course, uh, that is part of, of, the, of the, this, this type of procedures. Uh, we are a key stakeholder in the process, and we will develop also uh, in this procedure our arguments, including the relaxation. I think that, that is obvious. Um. Any other questions? Um, um, about Turkey, because you said that there is uh, an increase in imports from Turkey. Is there any way to, to stop it or to limit it through the safeguards, through this review? Or it's just that how, how does the import to the EU that the quota for Turkey is so big that they manage to import without uh, additional duties? or the EU importers are paying additional duty on the package. We are not aware, but we do not have access to all these data which are in the hands of the customs, but we are not aware that there is really significant volume, volume coming in and which are paid above the quota, the 25%. 25% is 
25% is, is a quite significant level uh, of additional burden. Um, but what we do see for some products indeed, and that is then in particular Turkey, uh, that is for long products, uh, rebar and wire rod. There, we have seen that the um, on the second of February, the, the the new final quota with a national quota for Turkey and some other countries like Russia also have national. But Turkey used its national quota rebar wire rod in nine to eleven days. Uh, this quota is national and runs from 2 February to end of June. And then it will go for another yearly uh, volume. So that is, of course, a shock in the market. This means that, um, that Turkey, once the decision was known publicly about the quota, final quota system, including the volumes that Turkey has been anticipating this and that through importers the material has been ready for declaration almost the same day of the opening of the quota. Which is a bit, you could question why they would do this because a national quota allows you, why did the commission accept in the final measure to go for national quotas? and not a global quota where everybody fights everybody to calm down a bit the trade flows and to avoid or to reduce the risk of speculation. So why is, is Turkey now filling in its quota in, in, a, in a week when the quota is calculated for a period which goes for four months here? It's not exactly from February to, to July because the national quota is exactly to give them the security that the volume over a certain period of time is assured to be exported to the EU without tariffs or without any duty. And still that immediately consumed it. Although they are not in competition within their own quota because it's for them anyway, it's reserved. So um, now uh, uh, an element which may explain this is that the Turkey, as a, an, any other country with a uh, national quota, could still, if it exhausted its own quota, national quota, mm -hmm. they could start to consume residual quota. So there is an incentive to eat up quickly your quota. And if you want to do more, you can then start to eat in the residual quota. And also the residual quota indeed has been very quickly, and that was even in three days, was uh, was hundred percent. So, so Turkey is basically, in terms of exports to the EU, is 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 eating everything they can, they can get a hold on. That probably will create some friction with regard to other third countries who, under the residual quota, would still have a possibility to send some material also to the EU, even if it would not be traditional big exporters. But still, the residual is there to to give leeway to others. But now they see that Turkey has eaten up, they are too late on this. So there is, an, there is a, a quite an aggressive pattern there. Of course, for the long products, the situation of Turkish steel industry is well known. The, these are electric arc uh, capacities. They lost 1 million ton a year in the US because the US uh, doubled uh, 25 to 50%. Markets are not all, well, our market is not closing in the EU. A tariff rate quota is not closing. It is maintaining trade flows. Uh, um, but uh, Turkey is in multiple anti-dumping measures, uh, although they are not always that high. There are safeguards from uh, Egypt, Malaysia on Turkey. Uh, the US, of course, they are totally out. So you have a combination there where there third countries are limiting or even closing their markets where Europe now is the only major outlet possible market available. And of course, the internal situation of Turkey is such that the economy, including construction, is depressed. 
which has immediately uh, exposed excess capacity. So numbers from experts circulate that uh, electric arc furnace capacities are reduced in terms of utilization rate down to only 50%, which means that they are, they are in a crisis situation then domestically. And EU is a neighbor market. It's not like Taiwan or China. So they, they can perfectly develop the logistic chain to bring in massively volumes within, within their quota. And now they have even taken all the volume from. We think 70% of the residual is also taken by Turkey. So you have a problem there. We think that the Commission acknowledged this because this is a, a pattern of trade, which is exactly what the safeguard should avoid or contain. So there are some flaws there um, in the system for certain specific products, in particular for the long products. You have the similar situation also, but it's less visible because you have only the global quota for hot rolled flat. Uh, but the, in January and February, at the start of the final measures, hot rolled flat, Turkey imported 500,000 tons massively at prices which are lower than European ones. Of course, you still need to work with the price in order to find somewhere an outlet in, in, the, in the market. Um, at that time, prices were already going down or under pressure in Europe because demand depression started to, to realize. So the condition was already very fragile. Then you have the hit of 500,000 tons, hot rolled flat at the time. And we see then iron ore costs going up, particularly in Brazil with problems in Bali. So where then there was a need to, to at least maintain prices to avoid too much of a cost price squeeze we, uh, the market had a hit of, of 500,000 tons from, from Turkey in, in, in a month time, which has then basically uh, triggered the further spiraling down of, of, of the price. And this is why the hot roll coin price today in Europe is, is for, for 50, 460, coming from 5, 560. Yeah. So that, that, is a, that is a, I think these type of situations, which are rather product specific, will draw, will have the attention of the Commission. How they're going to address this, how they are going to fix it, that's of course another question. But this is, this is clear to us and it, we think it is also clear to the Commission. Yes. <laughs> I have a question about EU exports. Uh, because there are, as you mentioned, other countries are also imposing safeguards. Uh, the latest one is, I think, Canada. Canada is also imposing safeguards on the EU field of uh, imports. So how much of the problem is it is it for the no. No, Canada is not really, uh, I don't know you don't but not really. this is not really on our radar screen, let's mm -hmm. say, as association. We don't talk for companies. Yeah? There are individual companies, some who, who have done, I think some long products have done some business in Canada. But overall, this, this is not of the size which changes trade flows. Mm -hmm. US, of course, is. Yeah. Europe potentially is. Yeah. But, but not Canada. So. Uh, moreover, I think that they are now going into a final safeguard measure, which reduces a lot, take out some products. So the product scope of the Canadian safeguard would final, because they also have provisions and now they're final. I don't know if it's yet decided, but it seems that there is recommendation to the ministry to reduce significantly the product scope, which would make it even less of, a, of an impact. Mm -hmm. But uh, the problem is, as I understand it, is that the they are not going to uh, follow the historical trade flows, so they will reduce them. The EU decided to, to follow, to, to keep their 100 or even 105% of the additional trade flows, but they, they are not planning to do so. What did you say? Yeah, I don't have a really a very detailed view on, on how, they, how they do it. Um, there has been a system of uh, 
they don't have really national quotas as in the um, as in the EU now system or uh, safeguard. They have an um, uh, they, but they do they calculate global quota for the product because safeguard is after all global. Uh, and then they have integrated a, a rule where they do a split up, or where they make, put caps on what one exporting country can do maximum under the global quota. And that reflects the traditional percentage of that country in a reference period of what they have exported to the Canada. So if, if let's say Europe uh, has been assumed that Europe would have, would be taken as a whole here, uh, but for the sake of the argument, EU would have been an exporter of hot rolled flat to Canada, rep a volume representing 8% of the total volumes in the last three years in Canada. Then the, then the eight percent would be a cap mm -hmm. for Europe. So they would they would apply caps on what an individual com country can do within the global quota. So these are variations on the same principles. Um, so Canada is not a. It, uh, now we just learned this morning that Turkey, who also initiated the, the safeguard, has now decided to stop its own safeguard. That would have been published a decision this morning. Over the first two months of the year, Canada was the seventh largest export destination of the EU. So definitely not in the. Uh, it, it is let's say not of very minor importance. We were shipping to Canada, but it's it's not as big as the, the volumes going to Turkey or or the US or Switzerland, Algeria. Yeah. Uh, I, I also have a question regarding the quota, um, because as you say that the quota is based on the average volume um, during 2015 to 2017. Uh, and uh, we also noticed that uh, the Middle East and North Africa, this region, uh, since last year, this region become the uh, meat export region. Uh, just since last year. So, excluding Turkey, I wonder that in the next few years, will Europe also consider about other um, countries in those uh, in those regions? And uh, this quarter will will also be changed, or or it will maintain just uh, based on the average volume um, during 2015. This this region indeed is a uh, is building up capacities because yes. it has been yes. traditionally an importer and. They also want their own, everybody wants his own new steel industry. Uh, the, the, so these upcoming countries or who, who start to industrialize, they start with a, their own steel industry. This is why excess capacity is getting worse and worse worldwide. Um, th so that, that I think we are aware of this, that that is a region where there is new capacities coming in to replace imports. But we also know that capacities replacing imports become at some point capacities to export. And they will come to Europe. They come to the south, and and so this is another additional pressure point we will face in the next years. Um, to what extent that will then be integrated or will be reflected in the safeguard? That's a bit. I think the safeguard is still rather short term. It will expire unless they renew it, but it will expire in 2000 mid 2021. Um, now, typically, these the countries of these regions are already excluded from the safeguard because they are self-declared developing <coughs> countries. That's another issue <laughs> there of uh, the, the exemption of developing countries based on the, the declaration of these countries themselves. They say, "I am developing," and they, and then we say, "Okay, you, you say you're develop developing. Okay, then I will take you out." Okay, but that's a, dis that's a discussion on its own. But so these countries already now are basically out of the safeguard. So they can build up exports outside the, the quota system. However, there is a rule also, and that will be part of the review, that once these countries become in their exports, minimum 3% for a product of the total European imports, then you can take them in and give them their own treatment to integrate them in the safeguard. So the commission will most likely also look into the developing country list uh, in the review 
um, based on the three percent rule. Yeah. But I, I I fully agree with with uh, referring to the the new dynamics we can expect from these regions, Middle East, uh, MENA region, mm -hmm. in terms of steel capacities coming on stream and trade uh, trade uh, outside that region. Uh, we could imagine that Algeria could become an exporter of rebar to the south of Europe, which would be the other way around, the, the world upside down. <laughs> so, but uh, the safeguard for the moment leaves, leaves that alone, uh, unless there is one country now, developing country, who suddenly starts to push too much material in Europe, then you can bring them in once it becomes 3%. That's a threshold, WTO threshold. <laughs> 